Hello, I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak with amazing women of improv all over the world. Today I talk to Demika Parker. She is from Portland, Oregon, through and through, and we talk about the fact that both of her parents were performers and improvisers, and so she had improv all around her from the age of zero. What does that do to a human? How cool can you be if you're from Portland plus improv? I mean, let's just find out. I hope that you Hello are. everyone, welcome to the super crazy edition of Improving the World. Hello. Hello. So you're an improviser and you own a theater that you run there in Portland called Deep End Theater. Such a good name. I'm dubbing you an improv baby. Oh, thank you. And hence, because of this, as people watch these videos, they know I choose to change my background to match the topic. And we were looking for baby pictures and we kept finding one singular adorable baby, which frankly will not do. My head will, will block the baby. So we found this really upsetting selection of, I'm trying to be this one, this upsetting selection of dolls, but I'm worried that we'll just freak viewers out. So we're including it, I'm gonna change it and I'll probably turn it back on at the very end. <laughs> Apologies if we've just terrified the dickens out of you. We'll go to something slightly more about learning and education. Okay, so there we go. It's safe now. When did you first become aware of improv? I was aware pretty young that my parents were sillier than other adults, more playful than other adults, and I was regularly a part of their rehearsals for improv, so they would take me with them or they would have the rehearsals at home. And I think the first time I realized that they were doing something different than other parents did, I was probably about five or six. And there are pictures of me trying on hats and other props and that sort of thing in one of their rehearsals. And I do remember that. When did you know what improv was? It was a thing, it was an art form, classes and workshops, like, can you learn this thing? Well, my parents both taught improv at Portland State University. Growing up in their classrooms, I learned a lot through watching them teach improv. The first time that I ever performed improv professionally, meaning that I was paid to do the performance, I was nine years old. And I think it was the first time that I realized really what improv was more than just just goofing around. Mm -hmm. We did theater sports competition for the whole city. So teams all around the city came to play and my dad was like the master of ceremonies for this. A college student had dropped out at the last minute and so my dad had scooted me in. So dad. <laughs> thinking I was very, very, very talented. <laughs> now in retrospect, I realized people were just laughing because I was probably <laughs> adorable. Oh, yeah. And also maybe incredibly talented when you were nine. Maybe. I just want to check this because my mind is reeling with excitement. Your parents were teaching university level improv. Does this mean they were teaching something else and they included improv in the curriculum or they were teaching an improv course? My father taught improvisational theater for 41 years at Portland State University. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I already okay. have Portland. It's such a high place in my mind. My brain cells are breaking right now. I'm so into this. Cool. I'm thinking of all of the stuff that my parents did and how that would come into our homes. My dad worked in tech and so there was tech integration in the home. My mom did facilitation and so good conversation and you know everyone listening. How did improv come into your home? <laughs> First of all, the silliness that I talked about earlier. There was a lot of silliness in play in my family and my parents really did play with us in a way that I don't see parents engaging in with kids very often. There was also a real sense that self-expression was incredibly important. They definitely put that first for us. And we also believed in our house that we could do or be anything we wanted to be. And I think that they were really inspired by the philosophies behind improvisational theater, believing in yourself, community, connecting to people. Those were things that I saw from a really young age that I think my parents absorbed from the work that they did outside of the house. I'm just thinking about all the different things that I'm experiencing when I'm young and how that flows its way into all the interactions I have as a kid. Did improv make you feel confident and focus on listening and all that kind of stuff? 
I think that it did. I think that I was a very emotionally intelligent child because of the way that I was being raised. And I think that had a lot to do with improv. It also had a lot to do with theater. But the way that I interacted with people was very mature because I had been given those tools and because I regularly exercised those tools with my parents. So mm -hmm. they let me demonstrate in their classes the games and exercises that they were doing, they would do with me. So I learned a lot about listening focused. I learned a lot about emotional intelligence, listening with my whole body, listening to other people's facial expressions and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. all from the improv work. What games or exercises do you remember doing as a kid in front of people for a demonstration? I remember very fondly playing gift giving with my dad, him giving me gifts and me giving him gifts, and then watching his students use what we had done as an example to give their own gifts. Also, I have a photograph of me helping my dad to teach a middle school group. It's a photograph of me teaching the gift giving game to a group of kids. Wow. It's always funny to me when you play gift giving with people who are really just starting improv. Whatever you do as a demonstration, some people can take it and fly and do something totally different, but sometimes they're really cemented into the one that you did. So like you give an apple and then they're giving pears and bananas. I have this vision of nine-year-old you pulling gum out of your mouth and then blowing a bubble and giving that. And then all of the adults are just replicating this because, you know, they're new at the craft. Yeah, I think what was interesting about having a child in the room was it gave people permission to be a little more free with their creativity and their imagination. Sometimes when I teach gift giving now, we'll have people who are really giving very rapid rounded gifts, like here is a ring that I got at the ring store. I think having a child in the room really inspires people to be more imaginative and more creative. I feel like you've just opened improv teaching hacking. We should all have a kid in the room to help because we all say as you grow through life, you start building these walls and no's and I shouldn't and I couldn't and all these things. And so through improv, we're trying to pull down those walls and they're inherently great improvisers. Maybe the true trick to improv is letting a kid kid teach it, <laughs> really, or help. Yeah, them. Hmm. it'll put a lot of us out of work, but I do think it's a wonderful idea. I just need to obtain a child. I haven't made any, so I need to, does anyone have a kid I can borrow? Right, that's my problem. Did other kids get it? Did other kids get you? Were you a little far left? And the other kids were like, what's going on with that chick? I think the kids were, what's going on with her? I was very silly and free, also very self-confident. It didn't go over really well with other kids. We talk a lot about kids being really open and free and silly and those walls that we build. But the truth is kids have a lot of walls themselves. When they're little, they can be even more judgmental than as they get bigger. Sometimes when you're an especially wackadoo child, which I would describe myself that way, you can rub the other kids wrong because they're worried about looking silly or looking immature. I also think I seemed weird a weird kid because I hung out with adults mostly my parents were in a theater community and an actor's community other kids hung out with kids and knew how to play with kids and I didn't really have that mm -hmm. I also had a lot of trouble with authority through growing up in theater there's so much freedom and there's so much freedom of self-expression and individuality that dealing with teachers authority rules was something that I didn't learn until much later. I hadn't thought of it like that, the way that you were explaining. And you're so right. Kids are just as judgmental as we all are, and sometimes more, because sometimes they're lacking a bit of the filter, which is those walls that we're building. Just like, I'll say anything because either they don't know or don't care. And this challenge with authority as a totally wackadoo child as well, I also struggled with that. Beyond the idea of pushing bounds, which we're all doing when we're young and always, there's this idea of, well, if I truly am being told to express myself and challenge and to ask questions, be silly, why is it not allowed all the time? Why shouldn't others be like that? Why are you trying to stifle? And this kind of thing. Right. Why does the improv have to stop now? Why isn't it always? Aren't we saying it's good for everything in life? Why are we not doing it now? Right, right. It's time to sit and be quiet and learn your lessons. Yeah. Sit in one of those great chairs. So yeah. feeling like, hang on a minute, I want to do my thing. Did that make you have a rebellious streak? A bit of a challenge sometimes with authority, totally get it. Did you pull away from improv? Were you like, ah, I've been taught all these things and then I'm hearing a counterpoint. So hang on a minute, I choose to not and I'm going to disengage. Did you kind of pull away from improv? I pulled away from improv very early in my high school career. <laughs> 
I was only in high school for the first six months of my ninth grade before I went off and did other things. But during that period, I remember auditioning for a couple plays at my high school. And the director of the drama club knowing my parents and being really familiar with me as a child of my parents. And it felt really humiliating to me to be known by this person as a child when I was trying to be a grown-up adult ninth grader. I remember thinking that I just didn't want to be riding their coattails. I didn't want to be going into theater in this town where my parents were very, very popular in theater mm -hmm. at the time and have everyone know me as the child of these great actors. It was mm -hmm. a lot of pressure and it also didn't feel like it was my choice at that point. It felt like what I was supposed to do. And mm -hmm. so I rebelled against it pretty strongly. And until I was about 24, I didn't do theater at all. Did you miss it when you weren't doing it? Or did it feel right to take a break and do your own thing? Well, I think I missed it. And I think it showed up in a lot of ways, my behaviors and my personality. It wasn't something that I thought about on a conscious level, like, oh, I'm missing something. It's got to be theater. It was more in community. What I was missing was the community that theater creates and the community that improv theater creates. I started to really miss that when I returned to school in my 20s. I was my dad's assistant at Portland State teaching in his classroom with him. And that happened very quickly. I just went from having pulled completely away from improv to being really immersed in it again with my dad, all because I had met a woman at a job I had who was very playful and silly, fun to be around. She and I were really enjoying each other and really connecting in a different way than I had connected with other people. And one day she said, do you know anything about improv? And I thought, oh my gosh, I have this whole life experience with improv. And she said, would you like to teach a class with me? And I started teaching with her, which led quickly to me teaching teaching with my father at Portland State, and that quickly led to me teaching around the world. Ooh. The pull to bring you back in was just connecting with another person. It was all there waiting. The person opened the door and said, hey, you want to dive in? And you were like, mm, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just like that. Wow. What is the difference now, Damika, between the improv that you practice, perform, preach, enjoy, versus the sort of, let's call her pre-break you, under the wing of parents, the university and the construct that they had and what they were doing? How has your improv either awareness or content shifted? Well, the content has actually shifted a lot. <laughs> The improv that my parents did was improv comedy. When I was interested and when I was doing improv as a kid, it was all very comedic, games-based work, Keith Johnstone-inspired work. As I came back to improv as an adult, I found that I was really attracted to improvisational theater over improv comedy, attracted to discovery over invention-based work. And so instead of doing games-based improv, I started to do really theatrical work acting first. I considered myself an actor who specializes in improvisation rather than a comedic improviser. Is that still now how you think of yourself as an actor with improv? Yeah, I'm definitely an improviser. The reason I say actor who specializes in improvisation is because improvisational theater is the only stage acting that I do, but it is acting. A lot of the work that I see around the world is not teaching acting as a focus. And so people are often learning some acting through the games and exercises. But I think that the work is much, much richer when there is an acting focus. Do you still now do comedy or yeah. do you kind of, oh, you do. Okay, I was wondering if maybe you shy away from that. No. No, I feel like to be a truly accomplished improviser, you need to be able to span the whole breadth of the theatrical experience from the most poignantly dramatic to the most absurdly comedic. And I enjoy both very, very much. What I don't find as interesting as an adult is the real games-based performance work where you go up and do a game for an audience, much rather tell a story or improvise a full-length play or a montage of scenes than play games for an audience. Bonus question that I just 
thought of it. I'm curious about the people that you choose to work with and play with where you are in the world and also like in the U.S. There are a lot of choices of performers. I feel like the West Coast of the U.S. has a decent <laughs> selection of improvisers, performers, and so on. Do you find that you equally are wanting to work with folks like yourself who have some good foundational background of improv but want to do something longer, more kind of theatrical? Or do you like people who are the opposite of you and you balance? Well, I have fun a lot playing with people who have opposite philosophy to me. It really does create a really nice balance on the stage. I also find that I'm attracted to people who really see improv as an art and a craft that share a lot of my philosophy. I'm spoiled for choice of who to play with, and I like to get a little of everything. Fair. And happy if people want to play with me, so. Yeah, that is part of it, yes. <laughs> you do have to want to play with you, too. Yeah. And what's interesting is as a child, they didn't want to play with me, but as an adult, I find playmates all the time. Oh, yay. We got there in the end. What a journey. <laughs> Finally, look at us. Yeah. Oh. Tell me, please, what are your words of wisdom? If you could speak to the younger version of you, your improv community peers, or someone who's not done improv before, they find this video, they're curious. What are your words of wisdom? Trust yourself. Enjoy yourself. Know that it's a journey, and there will be a point where you feel like you know it all and you don't yet. And there will be a point where you feel like you can't learn anymore and you're not there yet. There's never a place in improv experience where you know it all or you're the master of it. That never ever will occur. So really enjoy the moment that you're in. Really dig in. Let yourself be free and go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Demika, if people are in Portland, hanging out, they want to come to the theater, see a show, collaborate, just generally throw money at you, how can people find you? You can find me at deependtheater.com, Deep End Theater in Portland, Oregon. And I assume yeah. it's the E-R, not R-E, spelling of theater. It's, I forgot. <laughs> it's E-R. It's ER. We're not British. I love that you forgot. Sure, it's your theater. Okay, lady. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been there. <laughs> I'll include information below. Thank you so much for your time and your energy. It was really wonderful to chat with you, and I appreciate it. You're um, welcome very much. Thank you. All right, all. This is Improving the World. Uh, oh, wait a minute. We got to close it this way. Thank you all so very much for tuning in. I'm Lauren. This is Improving the World. And there's more where that came from. Bye. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind and beautiful things in the comments down below. And you can subscribe if you're feeling sassy and look for more from Propping the World. Thanks.